everyone and welcome to this new LT Spice video in which we are going to analyze the power of an RLC circuit. We are going to simulate an RLC circuit in alternative current with the point AC function in order to visualize the complex active, reactive and apparent power as well as the power factor. Finally, we will also decompose the reactive power. First of all, a small theoretical reminder of what you have seen in class. Here are the formulas for the active power, the reactive power, the apparent power, which is defined as the active power on the real axis and the reactive power on the imaginary axis, thus multiplied by i. In this course, we use g instead of i because I is already for the current. Finally, the power factor, which is defined as the cosine of the impedance argument. We notice that when this cosine is equal to one, the apparent power equals the active power. Here is the RLC circuit. We had studied this same circuit in a previous video. Here, I named this part one the one after the inductance 2 and the one after the resistor 3. We are going to do a frequency sweep with the point AC function with 100 measurement points per decade. The frequency spectrum studied ranges from 1 Hz to 10 MHz. The voltage source for the measurement with the point AC control has been defined with an amplitude of 20 volts. Just before we talk about power, I would like to draw your attention to something. I have run the simulation and measured the input voltage. It is worth 20 volts. As we have defined the source with an amplitude of 20 volts, it is therefore the amplitude, peak value of the signal, that is measured here. We will now move on to the power analysis. I'll put the measurement windows we are interested in in the foreground. I am going to enter the first expression which corresponds to the active power consumed by the circuit. This expression is the one written here. We have mag V1. In fact, mag is used to give the modulus of a complex value. It can only be used when we have sinusoidal signals and the simulator knows it. In this case, it knows it since the simulator has been started with the point AC command, which uses the voltage source in sinusoidal mode. We have mag V1 times the modulus of the current times the cosine of the phase of V1 divided by the current, it is the cosine of the circuit impedance, all divided by two. In fact, the moduli expressed here are peak values, so each one is root of 2 times greater than the RMS value. I decide to adopt a linear scale. So we have the active power. I now calculate the reactive power. It is the same formula except that instead of the cosine, we have a sine. I change the color to improve readability. With the phase, we can draw some interesting information. I display the phase between minus 5 degrees and 185 degrees. Concerning the reactive power, the phase is first 180 degrees and then 0 degrees. So, we have a real reactive power, first negative and then positive. The active power on the other end is always positive. A passive circuit can store or restore power but not produce it. In a new panel, I will define the apparent power. This is the active power on the real axis plus the reactive power on the imaginary axis. We obtain a phase which evolves, logically 
given the variation of the reactive power. We can also visualize the apparent polar according to an Nyquist representation. We then obtain the active polar on the real axis and the reactive polar on the imaginary axis. If you move around with the cursor, you can find out at what frequency a given combination active polar and reactive polar is present. By using the tools of LTSPICE, you can see where you are on the real axis, on the imaginary axis, and what is the magnitude, the phase, etc. If you look at the reactive power, we notice that it is almost zero at 1.6 kHz. By studying this RLC circuit in another video, we had obtained that at 1.6 kHz, the circuit behaved in a resistive way, or in other words, that the impedance was purely real. Ides, its argument was worth zero. Ides, its cosine was worth one. Ides, the power is purely active and the power factor is one. With Nyquist's representation, it is difficult to move to the extremes. Ides, to the places where the derivative tends toward infinity. So I will put this graph back in both representation. I note with my cursor that at 1.6 kHz, the apparent polar module is 200 mW. Its phase is about 0 degrees and the reactive polar is almost 0. I measure the active polar with another cursor. It is also about 200 mW with a phase of 0 degrees. So, the apparent power is about equal to the active power. We will now move on to the second phase of this power analysis. I will remove this table and add a new one on which I will first display the power consumed by the inductor. I would like to remind you that the ideal resistor consumes only active power and the ideal capacitor and inductance only consume reactive power. We will first display the reactive power consumed by the capacitor. So we take the voltage at node 3, multiply it by the current. I also adapt the phase from which we take sign. I perform the same adaptation for the power consumed by the inductance subjected to the voltage V1 minus V2. By the way, as all components are in series, the current is the same wherever you look. Again, I change color for the readability. Finally, I add a table showing the current in the circuit. It can be seen that the addition of the reactive powers of the capacitance and T's of the inductance does indeed give the total reactive power. It can also be seen that these elements only have a significant influence on the power consumption in a specific band of spectrum. Elsewhere, the power it consumes tend towards zero. We will now make the following analysis. We know that at low frequencies, the capacitance behave like an open circuit and at high frequencies like a short circuit and vice versa for the inductance. These can easily be deduced from the formulas in the course. We can see, for example, for an inductance that at constant voltage, an increase in frequency is compensated by a decrease in current. We can see that at low frequencies, here on the left, the capacitance tends towards an open circuit. The current, therefore, tends towards zero and the power tends towards zero, the voltage being a finite value. At high frequencies, the same blocking occurs due to inductance. 
From the left, the reactive prayer consumed by the capacitance increases to a local maximum and tends toward zero again. Since the behavior of the capacitance tends to run a short circuit, the voltage at its terminals tends to run zero. But because of the other components of the circuit, the current is finite. For the inductance, the behavior is the opposite. At low frequencies, it behaves like a short circuit, then the power voltage multiplied by current reaches a maximum. Finally, the behavior tends towards that of an open circuit and the circuit is blocked again. We will now analyze the signs of reactive power. I change the scale again by extending it from minus 5 to 185 degrees. We can see that the arguments for the reactive power of the capacitance and inductance are 180 and 0 degrees respectively. This means that the reactive power of the capacitance is always negative real and that of the inductance is always positive real which can be seen in the formulas. Dividing by g is indeed equivalent to multiplying by minus g. This leads to the fact that at a certain frequency, the reactive powers compensate each other. We then obtain a purely resistive circuit at this precise frequency. So that's it, we went around what we had to discover about the analysis of the powers of this circuit. I thank you for your attention and look forward to seeing you soon for new videos. Mm -hmm.